My last video showed how to build counters whose counting frequency can be adjusted by very small amounts. I'll put a link to that video below. This video will make much more sense if you've seen that one. In this video, we'll integrate the counters onto an SOC with a Pico RV32 RISC-V core and use that platform to experiment with controlling the counting frequency using the pulse per second signal from a GPS receiver. This will make the counter frequency quite accurate. The experiments are run on a Tang Nano 20K FPGA development board, but the Tang Nano 9K is also supported. The FPGA board uses a crystal oscillator for a clock. We will see if we can detect and quantify how that clock's frequency varies with temperature changes of only a couple of degrees Celsius. The temperature effect is easy to see. In general, this project presents an inexpensive way to accurately timestamp events via a GPS discipline timer. Here's the counter design from the last video. Recall that we precisely changed the frequency of counters time counter and PPS counter by changing the value of a Q minker. In this video, we will use the timestamp facility. PPS in is the pulse per second signal from the GPS receiver. On its rising edge, the value of time counter is captured into registered timestamp for processing by software. On the Tang Nano 20K, Clock PPS is 120 MHz, and a QM inker is selected to make time counter and PPS counter count at around 100 MHz. Time inker is set to 10. It is a convenience to let the unit of the timestamps be nanoseconds. The design can have other event timestamps, like event stamp shown. We won't use it today, but it is actually the GPS discipline timestamp. Imagine using it to implement something like a frequency counter that is made very accurate by GPS. The integration of the Pico RV32 core consists of making registers accessible to software running on the core. Some of the registers can be written and others read. Notice that the timestamps are 64 bits wide, so they have separate 32-bit low and high registers. I'm not going to dive into the Verilog for the integration. You can see it on GitHub, link below. If you've seen my other videos on Pico RV32 integration, there's only one new thing. The counters and registers are in a separate clock domain from the Pico RV32. This means that the integration involves FIFOs, but I already made a video about using FIFOs to cross clock domains. I'll put a link to that below also. The main thing for today's video is a software feedback loop. The PPSN signal from the GPS causes a Pico RV32 interrupt once per second. The interrupt handler reads the timestamp and subtracts the value of the previous timestamp from it. If the difference is exactly 1 billion nanoseconds, then the GPS and time counter frequencies are perfectly matched. Any difference from a billion means that a QM inker must be adjusted. On reset, the feedback loop must converge a QM inker to the value that gets the timestamp difference as close to 1 billion as it can. Let's watch that convergence. Here's the test setup. The GPS module is the Adafruit Ultimate GPS Breakout V3. I don't think it is available anymore, but any cheap GPS module with a PPS output should work. The system's running. The Pico RV32 serial port data is shown in the blue rectangle. The oscilloscope output is in the upper right. It's showing the PPS pulse out signal with PPS count set to 100,000 to give a 1 kilohertz output. The scope is measuring 1.00002 kilohertz in the very upper right. The feedback loop is converged, so I think this means my scope's clock is a little off. I think the true frequency is very close to 1 kHz. If I type HE to the serial port, I see a list of commands, and some of them are related to the pulse per second timers. So if I type IX, that disables printing once per second information about how the system's converging. We'll see that in a minute. IU can stop it from doing the feedback loop. It just leaves a Q minker at, at its current value. IA is a command to set a QM inker, and IP is a command to set PPS count. IT reads the current PPS timestamp. So I could show an IT real quick. So that's the current timestamp. If I do another one, that's the current timestamp. So what I'm going to do now is do IX to turn the printing of information back on. And this is being printed in response to the interrupt from, from the GPS unit. And so what it's doing is a, is getting the timestamp difference, this timestamp minus the last timestamp, and calculating the difference from the expected value. So the most interesting number is this column here that's near zero, the difference from the expected one billion. And then in the far right, there's the new accumulator value 
the new accumulator inker value that it computes. And you can see that that changes a little bit as it continues to try to adapt. And what I'm going to do now is press the reset button. And when I do that, you might see the frequency change just for a moment in the oscilloscope output, but you'll also see the, the, the difference from 1 billion get larger and you, we can watch it converge back down towards zero. So I'm going to press the reset button now. And so the system has been reset and we can see the difference is much larger, but coming down. So it takes a little bit of time to converge because I don't want the convergence rate to be too large, essentially because I don't want it chasing noise when it's already converged. So you can see about how long it takes to get back to where it was, where it was, you know, reading within about hex 20 of zero. And we're there. If the GPS reception were to glitch and perhaps miss a one second pulse, you'd see a convergence similar to what happens after a reset. While we're here, I'll stop the printing again and maybe show another command and you can watch the oscilloscope. And so I can change the PPS count by doing a PI command. So if I change that, oh, it's actually PI is going to show me the number of interrupts. So it's an IP command. And if I change that to something different than decimal 100,000, like hex C000, we'll see the frequency change in the oscilloscope. So you can control that like that. I could also manually enter a value of a Qminker, but to make that interesting, I have to stop the updating. If I do IU, it stops the updating. And now if I turn on printing again, you'll see that the accumulator inker never changes in the far right column. So I'll turn that off. And let's try setting a Qminker to something kind of far off the normal value, let's say 8000000, and that should cause the oscilloscope frequency to change also. And so you can see that that worked. So that's how the system works. And the most interesting thing is seeing the convergence. I think this is also fun to watch. The terminal window on the upper right and the yellow trace on the scope show my Tang Nano 9K connected to a different GPS receiver module. The lower terminal window and the magenta trace are the Tang Nano 20K and its GPS receiver. But this board has just been powered on and its GPS does not yet have a fix, so it is not receiving pulse per second interrupts. The yellow trace from the 9K is exactly 1 kHz, but the 20K has not yet converged, so its magenta trace is not exactly 1 kHz. The phase drift you see is because the 20K's frequency is slightly off. But now, the 20K gets a GPS fix. You can see the phase drift slow and stop as the 20K's feedback loop converges. After convergence, both FPGA's counters are counting at the same rate. There is no noticeable phase difference even after an hour. Let's take at least a quick look at software. So we'll open main.c and look for the interrupt handler. So this is the C function that gets called for any interrupt. So in particular, if an interrupt comes from the GPS pulse per second, we're going to call a function called process PPS. So let's look at that. That's here. And the first thing it does is call PPS get timestamp to get the 64-bit timestamp that's most recent. And we want to do some checks on that. We don't want to update a Qminker if this measurement is crazy. So in particular, if it's negative, we'll do nothing because time has had to have passed. And also, the clock on the Tang Nano board isn't going to be that far off. So if this timestamp difference is unreasonably large, we also think that's some sort of glitch or a bad, bad pulse, so we'll ignore it. And if we decide that we do want to process, which is true if we're not inhibiting the updating, and, and if we've decided that the reading is sane, we call a function called adjust. And that's going to calculate a new value of a Q minker, and then we call function PPS set a Q minker to set it, to do the feedback loop. So function adjust is pretty simple, and I have no doubt that this could be more sophisticated, but what it does is it calculates the, uh, the difference, taking care of sign since we're doing un unsigned arithmetic, it calculates a difference between the observed period and the target period, and actually divides that by four. And the goal there is to sort of pretend that the reading was closer to ideal than it really was, and make a smaller, and thus make a smaller adjustment. 
We don't want to adjust all the way to the correct target value because we might chase noise if we do that. So it's basically calculating the new acu minker. You're just using a ratio between the target period, the period desired, which is 1 billion nanoseconds, and the observed period that's been corrected just to make the convergence a little bit slower. So that's the core of the algorithm. Let's also take a quick look at pps-timer.c. And this file is pretty simple. At the top, you'll see the addresses of the registers that we saw before. But then there's just one thing to notice is that when we're getting 64-bit values, we have to do two 32-bit reads to do that. And in order to make sure there wasn't a rollover problem, we want to read the high register twice. So we read it, read the low, read the high again, and only accept the value if the values in the high order register didn't change between reads. And so that's a little bit of a trick that's used to make sure that we can get the correct 64 bits. And we're actually using the unsigned long, long type. So we can do 64-bit arithmetic on the Pico RV32 core, which is pretty convenient. And so that's kind of a quick summary of the software. Once the feedback loop has converged, how well does it stay converged? This graph shows a 4.4 hour run. The graph is showing the observed period's difference from 1 billion. You can see that it stays within about 50 nanoseconds of the ideal value. It means the convergence is quite stable, provided the GPS reception is good and there is no missed or messed up pulse and no loss of fix. The Adafruit GPS receiver connected to the 20K has an antenna wire that lets me place its antenna very near a window. I see no glitches more than once per hour or two. The GPS connected to the Tang 9K has a very short antenna cable. I don't have a good way to place it as close to the window. This setup is much less reliable because the GPS reception indoors is poor, so GPS reception on cheap GPS modules and antennas is a challenge to this method. The feedback loop's job is to keep time counter aligned with the period of the GPS PPS signal. To do that, it varies a cum inker to correct for any change in the clock PPS frequency. What could change clock PPS's frequency? Temperature could do it. I recorded the ambient temperature once per second about two feet away from the Tang nano board while also logging the board's prints. My air conditioner turns on and off, causing the temperature to vary a little bit. The graph shows the results. Changes in temperature correlate with changes in acume anchor. The temperature varies from about 23.5 to 26 degrees Celsius. Not a big change. The change in acume anchor is also small, a difference of less than 4,000 from the largest value to the smallest. That means that clock PPS is not changing by much. Can we quantify? Yes, we can invert the acume anchor formula and compute the frequency of clock PPS. This assumes that GPS and the time counter tracking of it are perfect. The graph shows the result. Clock PPS is varying by only 127 Hz. The feedback loop is making adjustments of less than 1 Hz in response to tiny temperature changes. I think it's very interesting that we can see this so clearly. This video has shown how a GPS pulse per second signal can be used with a software feedback loop to control counter frequencies and provide accurate timestamps. The method is sensitive enough to detect and correct for very small frequency changes associated with very small temperature changes. See below for a GitHub link. I'll end this video here. Thanks for watching.